Um, as I told, uh, as Elena already told, I'm uh, from the Netherlands, Eindhoven University. Eindhoven is in the, the south of the Netherlands, and we have Philips Medical Systems next door, so we have a lot of collaboration with the medical healthcare industry. And I spent my whole life in medical imaging, and what I very much appreciate is that I have the opportunity to talk about the very new field, the artificial intelligence, deep learning, conclusional neural networks. And what I go do is not give a course in how you download TensorFlow, how you install Python, and how you run it, because there are a million of these courses, and you can find them anywhere. I will talk the first 20 minutes a little bit, what is the, the contextual processing of this done? What are convolutional neural networks? What is convolution about? And then the rest, I go actually deeper in what's actually happening in these deep learning networks. Why do they work? And how do they work? And what I especially do is I go look at the brain. And most of you don't know, but we have spectacular developments in computer vision. But we have the same spectacular developments in brain research. It's amazing what people have found. And the brain is also doing things in layers, deep layers. Exactly the same. So I will make a, a balance, a comparison between what's happening in the brain, what can we learn from the brain, and what can we learn from computer vision to understand what's, what's happening actually in both. How does visual perception work? How do we recognize? And how does these deep learning work? So we, we both benefit from each other. So what I will do, I go sit down right here, but I'm used to very interactive teaching. So if you have questions or whatever, please raise your hand or so and, and let's discuss. If it takes too long, I will make it shorter because I have a lot to tell. We only have three now, four hours. I have three main topics. The first will go on deep learning itself, AI. Then we go have quite a deep look inside the brain, what have they discovered, what, what happened. I will talk about applications, and mainly about what uh, Elena already said. Uh, how can you analyze images from the retina? You can easily make images from the retina. What do you see on the retina? They're blood vessels. And these are blood vessels from brain tissue, because the retina are is nerve tissue, so you actually look directly into the brain. And you can see a lot there, one of the things is you can see the beginning of diabetes. So that's how we do the application. So I'll talk about the retina check project. And then the last hour is let's ourselves play with the software. I brought some software tools and I show you some experiments and we can just play with it. If you use, download your own images, take your own face, whatever. We're going to estimate the age of you. Uh, lots of things. We're going to improve images. So let me sit down. So let's talk a little bit about the history. Uh, it's a pretty old brain, all these neural networks. And the field of artificial intelligence started in 84, and actually with a soup factory in the United States, Campbell Soup. You all have seen these cans of soup. And there was a guy who was uh, very experienced with the technology of this company. They have big sterilizers and cookers, and they have tens of uh, plants all over the United States. And these cookers were incredibly complex. Ten thousands of uh, cans of uh, were in there, and he knew everything. If it was too hot there, and there was some sound there, you had to close that valve. So this guy was worth millions. He flew from plant to plant, but he retired. And so they decided to put his knowledge into a list of rules. And they made hundreds of these rules. The guy told everything. If you see that there, and that there, and so. And then he retired, and he worked for about half a year. But then new rules came up. And it was actually impossible to keep this going on. So uh, it didn't work. And actually, that was the death of uh, it was a dead end street. And people did not believe in artificial intelligence anymore. So we had the the yeah, very big dip, it didn't work. People only used uh, not two deep layers, it were only three layers. And later, because we have the deep layers, we have the whole thing back. <coughs> and all these years that it did not really work, we had machine vision, and my field was computer-aided detection and computer-aided diagnosis. 
And that was a classical pipeline in which you put images or any data. You do some pre-processing, you remove the noise, you do segmentation. And this is then a big step to do feature extraction. So we worked for decades with how to extract features. Gabor filters, all kinds of features that people, edge detection, you name it. But it was handcrafted features. You had to design them. And today you learn them. Then you extract your features and you put them in a uh, classifier. And these classifiers, they could be all kinds of classifiers. People didn't know what to take, so they, they tried, I don't know, dozens of classifiers. So you take support vector machines, adult classifiers, uh, uh, linear discriminators. There are so many classifiers. So that was actually quite nice. It, it, it worked reasonably well. And in the end, you get a, it's called a feature space. So all these features that you measure, here we measure three features, so we get a three-dimensional face. This axis is how strong is the first feature. The second axis is how strong is the second feature. And then you get clouds, and the blue ones are the healthy ones, and the red ones are the sick ones, and the classifier is nothing else than find the best division plane in this case, or division line. And that worked reasonably well. And uh, then we got the deep neural network. And deep means many, many layers. And today we go up to, let's say, 150 layers. And all these layers are connected by weights. So these are neurons. And you have the input layer. Layers in the middle. These are called hidden layers. And you have output layers. And the input layers could be all the pixels of an image. So you can have a lot of input neurons. And the output is how many classes do you want? Suppose you do digit recognition, you have 10 classes from 0 to 9. Doctors, they only sometimes want uh, 2, healthy and benign. But we have a lot of connections here, and all these connections, how many connections do we have in modern neural networks? Well, it can add up to tens or hundreds of millions. And how do you find them? You start with your network, and it's random. You really don't know anything. And then you start to train it. And by training, you change all these little connections one by one, and I'll explain back propagation in a minute, how this works. But you have to do a lot of updating of all these weights until this network is really nice and working. And once the network is working, you have a full trained brain, you have an expert. And that's worth uh, a lot of money, because that thing is, yeah, a, let's say, like a medical expert, you put an image in, and he gives a diagnosis. So, the training is the most complicated part, it takes a long time, but once you have it, and I'm going to show you a whole bunch of trained networks. You can download them, and you can use them for all kinds of purposes, and you will see how powerful they are. That process is called inference. It means you have a trained network and you use it. So we're going to train it, and we're going to do inference. And what do these layers actually do? Well, if I put in, for example, for face recognition, you can put in a face, the first layer, and maybe we all know already, because the first 20 minutes is probably pretty well known for all of you, but then we go a little bit faster and a little bit more into what really happens. The first layer is doing edges <coughs> and lines and contours, doing some very simple detectors of, let's say, primitive features in the image. Later we will see that it is much more complicated than this. We do much more than edge detection. Edge detection is a derivative, and we will take much more derivatives from it. We take not only the first derivative, that's edges, but we also take the second derivative, and the third derivative, and the fourth derivative, and the fifth derivative. But what does it mean, the second derivative? What's the third derivative? We just don't know. I mean, not yet. After this course, you get a, more, a little bit of an idea. And that's why we need quite a number of filters here. But in principle, they do, they extract some very basic things. I suppose I want to find the nose. Well, the nose is already three edges. One, two, three. So I have to combine these edges. And then I cannot look locally, but I have to look a little bit further. And we call that the context. So the processing increases slowly in context. And it has to be an incremental step in context, in context expansion. So we go more and more. So all these edges together, they form the nose. But the nose, the eyes, etc., they form the face. And the face, with the thing, forms the person. And the persons form a group, and so on. So that contextual increment, that's the trick of deep learning. So if we learn the first filters, actually we have a lot of 
filters. And what, what is filtering? The Latin name for filtering is convolution. So we can work on convolutions. That's, that's where it's coming from. And if I have, let's say, 40 filters here, I have 40 measurements in every pixel that stands here. And that's a lot. So every pixel is now replaced by a whole stack of measurements. So I have this whole matrix of uh, pixels, and every one is a whole stack. That's a cube. And that's called a tensor. So that's why we have tensor flow. We're going to do a lot of tensor analysis. Is there anybody doing tensor analysis here? The mathematics of tensors? Eigenvectors of tensors, determinants of tensors. Have you heard of it? I did it in the past. Okay. Did you use it? Did you use it? Yeah. Okay. In the past. Okay. I'll tell a little bit more about that. But I now want to show what is actually going into this uh, simple level. Then you have these simple detections, lines. And now we go to the more complex level. Here we have noses and eyes. And here we have faces, etc. So the more layers, the more complex structures we can see. And of course, we learn today everything. We learn uh, handwritten digits. That's the famous example that every computer science student is doing. But we also learn to recognize whatever uh, faces, uh, diagnosis on x rays, we can do ultrasound uh, diagnosis. And Facebook has, for example, a face recognition system that can recognize one face in 1.2 billion different faces. <coughs> well, that's pretty spectacular. I can recognize maybe 1,000 faces, and then it's a, you know, that's a little bit my limit. But I didn't see enough faces. But if I see enough faces, then you can just learn. Well, what I can do is go deeper into vision. And these are the networks that people have discovered in the brain. Here is the cells in the retina. And they go to the back of our head. That's our visual cortex, as we call it. That's the beginning. But from the processing of the visual cortex, it goes to the next level. And all these levels are right here in the back of my head. It goes to, this is V1, the primary visual cortex. Then it goes to V2, V3, V4, V5, etc. And we have about, uh, it's not exactly clear, but about 17 layers in the visual system. And we are incredibly visual machines. Did you know that the quarter of your brain is for vision? The quarter, the whole back of your head, if I put my hand on my head, it covers my visual system. So we have hundreds of millions of visual processing cells. And all these cells do convolutions. So that means if we use images, it's directly used for us. That is why the Internet Explorer wants to use images. And we, we are also very sensitive for faces, that we have Facebook and so on. If you give a lecture, use images, because we are completely made for images. That's the one thing we are made for. So, we do now lots of convolutions, that's why they are called CNN, Convolutional Neural Networks. And it's called hierarchical learning, because the hierarchy is going from simple all the way to more complex. That's the hierarchical step. Let's look at some applications. Uh, this is a medical application. This is ultrasound. And this is ultrasound from a phantom. And you see here they have some bubbles under water. And it's pretty noisy. But if you train the system with very sharp ultrasound, the system knows, hey, it should be sharper. And then you give it some words from a noisy, unsharp way, it can learn the sharp way. So now, if you have enough training with sharp images, you can use corrupted, noisy images and make sharp images from them. Well, this is a revolution. If you have very noisy images, because it's very far away, low resolution, low in intensity, uh, you make the images much sharper. We even can fill in. So this image was severely corrupted because there was a lot missing. People use this, for example, in old films. You have all these scratches, and you need to fill it in. Well, if you fill it in with a little bit about the neighbor that's not filling in it properly, you need to fill this in with books. And this does exactly that, because the system has learned the neighboring context, and that is much more complex than different intensities. And we call this in painting. And if you want to remove uh, uh, letters or digits from the image, you can very nicely do that. 
We also have that we can learn not only to improve images, to recognize images, but you can even learn the style of images. So suppose you have uh, Cezanne, that's a very famous uh, painter. He had a certain painting style, so we show several hundreds of Cezanne uh, paintings. And then you ask the network, and it makes a Cezanne painting from this image, because it knows that you have an edge like this, how Cezanne used edges like that. And how Cezanne used uh, to draw, let's say, a sphere, which is a head, and then you say, okay, that style, I'll put in there, and then you see it comes out here. And then you go make later this afternoon your own face as a Van Gogh painting. It's quite nice. So you learn it with all the sunflower images, and you can do your own, your own tests. And let's see how these things work. And you can do very complex operations. This is a very complex perspective transformation in which you have to fold back the image uh, from a camera where you have all kinds of uh, uh, non-linear transformations. But you can learn the system how to do that. And then if you put in a new image, it automatically finds the folded back image. So from a panoramic image, you make the 3D image again. So the number of possibilities is getting every day. Uh, it, it explodes. And this is just a very tiny set of examples. I can give you hundreds of examples. And I'll show you some websites where you have these examples. Uh, the two famous ones are NVIDIA.com, the maker of all these uh, very fast computers. They have a news site, uh, NVIDIA.com news. Every day they have new applications from the journey. It's fascinating. It's really nice reading. About, uh, about uh, self-driving cars, about uh, uh, healthcare. And another one is medium.com. I'll show more of that uh, later on. In healthcare, it's exploding. We used to be, yeah, we were actually secondary class with the doctors because they said, yeah, you do a nice job, but you have 86% right, and we are 96% right, 97% right, so yeah, you, you can assist us, it's nice, and we can do some computer vision, and big companies gave some uh, nice applications. But today, we are the same as doctors, or even better than doctors. So now, the acceptance rate is very steadily increasing, and people say, hey, wow, this is interesting. And there's even some of the one who is scared, hey, I trained, I'm trained for radiology, am I still needed? Am I taken over by this whole system? I don't think it goes that fast, but uh, it is a spectacular <coughs> development. In for example, we see uh, a 3D analysis, for nodules, people who smoke, they develop the uh, uh, tumors in the chest. And to find it early is, of course, essential. Because if it's early, you can remove it. And once you remove it, the patient is healthy and you can stay another uh, decades of life uh, more. Um, and we have fantastic tools now to find in mammography, uh, breast cancer, lung cancer, the brain cancer, there are, there are so many areas where we can find it now. Uh, yeah, very solid applications. There are nice uh, books, there are many conferences, and the medical image conferences are now completely dominated by deep learning. You can no longer deliver a paper or publish a paper with a classical machine vision. You have to be in some neural network here. So it's, it, it's over 90%. And the reason is, of course, it works better. It's faster, it's cheaper, but you have to train it, you have to have a lot of data. The first book for radiologists just appeared. I wrote a chapter in this book. It's called Artificial Intelligence and Medical Engine. And this was also written by a radiologist. And this book covers the whole thing, many modalities, as I said, breast cancer, lung cancer, but also ethical issues and legal issues. So what we need is uh, big data. You probably upload your images to Google Photos. That's cheap and unlimited. But did you know that there are 1.2 billion photos uploaded <coughs> to Google every day? It's pretty amazing. And they do this service for free. And why in the world should a company do this for free? They do more for free. You have Google Street View. Hundreds of millions of streets by a car, and you, uh, have, you get it all for free. 
Well, this means that you learn from so incredibly many data that the Google Drive self-driving cars, they see a house, but they don't see a house. No, they see that that house, that that particular address. So they know exactly where they are. So it, 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 it's, it's getting scary. They really know very, very detailed. This is a demo. I can show you a little bit of my own photos, see if it's work. This is internet. I normally don't show my collection. Well, yesterday I had a dinner with Elena, so you see it was on the flower market. But the trick is that Google uses this to improve their learning capacity. And suppose uh, I was in the, uh, uh, in the zoo some time ago. I typed uh, rhinoceros. And I had thousands of images. And now it finds all the rhinoceros images in my incredible database. It even finds posters. Uh, it finds statues, uh, uh, small things even on the wall. So it's doing a really good job, even at range. And this is just from the pixels. There's not a single description that this image is a rhino. So it's really recognized. And how is that working? That's, that's the deep thing, because using it is very easy. You download TensorFlow and you train it and it works. But that's, that's completely not interesting because everybody's doing it and you have thousands of competitors that do all the same. So let's, let's go a little bit deeper in what happens here. Um, oh. Let's do my PowerPoint. So we saw some uh, Google Photos. Um, this is in the medical area. If you want to get lots and lots of data, uh, you go to a hospital and you ask, uh, give me 10,000 uh, CT scans or give me 50,000 ultrasound scans. And you don't get it. Because it's too much work. The doctors own it. Uh, they won't give it to you because, because yeah, or you have to say, well, uh, you have to pay for it. So it's uh, really difficult to get data sets. Uh, we used to have challenges, games, in which computer vision groups said we have uh, we make available a very big uh, set of uh, let's say X-rays from the uh, uh, X-rays from the thorax, and we're going to do uh, lung cancer detection. So we make available uh, a thousand images, and we have uh, the winner gets the prize. And that was called Grand Challenges, and there's a website, and that's a superb. Uh, data set to get data set. And there are quite a few challenges right now. There are already 171 challenges. Uh, kidney and tumor segmentation, uh, pathology, uh, it's, it's on endoscopic. So there are on all the medical fields, you can download fantastic data sets. For retina, for example, you have the, the thing of retinopathy, that, 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 that's the illness of the retina, 90,000 images, you download them. And the nice thing is that from half of the images, <coughs> they have told exactly what is wrong. So, is it diabetes or not? And the other half is open. And you have to find from the other half what is the classification. So this is a very nice way to uh, get your own data and work with it and uh, yeah, train your own data set. So, let's go a little bit into the brain. We have all these uh, data sets. All, all, all these layers. So from the retina here, there is a fiber optic, uh, and, and the, the thick fiber, the optic nerve, goes to the middle of the brain. You see it here, it's LTN, lateral geniculus nucleus, it's in the thalamus. Then it goes to the back, and here we have V1, V2, all these layers. And here they are. And these layers do, in the first layer, indeed, edge detection. And here we have more and more complex detection, and here somewhere we have complete face detection. You stick a needle in one of these cells in the monkey, for example, and you can see this needle, this cell only fires if you show a face. If you show an orange or a chair, it doesn't fire, but only on, on the face. So that's a really high level thing. So the mathematics, 
and we slowly go a little bit into this mathematics, is actually that we model the connections between neurons. And this is a cell body called the soma, and it has one long output, it's called the exon. And if you have connections from other cells, they are called synapses. And these are the weights. And if you use synapses in your own body, uh, how do you learn? Well, you use a synapse many times. And when you use a synapse many times, it grows. It really gets bigger. So bigger synapses means you have learned it. And it's a big weight. So you have a strong connection from one to the other. If you forget, your synapses disappear. And they can completely disintegrate. And one cell has about 50,000 synapses. You have 10 to the tens of cells. So how many synapses do you have? An incredible amount. And they continuously shrink and grow, and they do this all the day. So they, they, that, that goes until your whole life. So we learn by adapting these weights, and it's exactly what we do that first do. And we used to work with three layers, putting all kinds of animals, and we tested what animal is it. This is, is it a cat or not a cat, so this is a yes-no output. But all these networks were, as I said earlier, quite disappointing. Uh, we had the big challenge that was 1.2 million images, it's called ImageNet. They were made available by Stanford University. And there were 1,000 classes, and there was a big uh, yeah, challenge between them. There was a big competition between all the computer vision groups. How many can you classify? So you downloaded 1.2 million images, and then uh, you did your, uh, yeah, your job. And about, uh, in two ta and about what is it, uh, uh, five years ago, uh, there was a guy, uh, Alex Kozewski, he, in one year, he went from 84 to 92%. He made an incredible jump. And today we have 96.5%. So, he started to use deep learning. And from that success, everybody jumped up and said, wow, this is so interesting. And now we have this complete revolution. Everybody's now really crazy about it. You, you cannot do anything else. The reason it's so full here is that you're all interested in, hey, wow, this is deep learning. This is the hot stuff. In five years, it's all normal. We all use it. And then we don't get this full room anymore. But it's, it's spectacular. And here you see a little bit the uh, detailed structure of a network. So let me look at the figures here. If this is the input image, it's a small image, 224 by 224 pixels. So it's a small image of something, let's say a cat or a dog. And these are the small filters. And this filter is, let's say, 11 by 11. And convolution means that you multiply all the values of the filter with all the, all the pixel values that are below it. And then you take the next one, the next one. So you, you shift pixel by pixel, and you use that all of the time, and that's the convolution process. So it is a shifting operation. So this convolution leads to a new number here, and the outputs of all the multiplications, they are summed together. So this multiplication and adding them all up, and it gives you a new number here. But because you do this for every pixel, you get a complete new image, but you do not take one filter, but in this case they take 48 filters. So quite a number of filters. What's in the filters? We don't know yet. We have to first train the filters, because in the beginning the filters are completely random. So we get this stack of images, this stack of numbers for every pixel, and this whole block is called a tensor. But because it is a little bit exploding in data, people say, okay, Let's reduce that a little bit, and let's take some uh, averages. So we take here 5 by 5, uh, uh, 25 pixels, and we take the average for the maximum. Most people take the maximum, the highest value. And then you reduce the whole data set 25 times, and that's called pooling. So we have here a layer of max pooling. And then you start filtering again. So you do again, and you do 128 filters. You do pooling again, and you do filtering again. And that pooling, filtering, etc., step after step, that is what you have to master. That's the art of designing a neural network. And nobody knows exactly how to do that. How many layers, how many pooling, what's the size of the layers. So what everybody is doing is try and error. Take 17 layers, take 25 layers, take 11 by 11 filters, take 13 by 13. And that's amazing how people do that. 
Uh, it's a lot of hard work, and of course we get now automatic systems that do that for you, and they, and they automate, but it, it's, it's very annoying that it is heuristic. Uh, we don't understand it. There is, there is no beautiful theory yet. Uh, the brain is not testing everything. The brain is, uh, when you are born, you, you learn from the beginning, and you're not testing 20,000 20, different network configurations. You do it right away, right? So maybe we should look at the brain, what's happening there, how does it do it directly right? But the principle here, as I said, it is going from simple to complex. Lines become corners, become squares, become boxes, and then finally become, in this case, a cap. So I saw before, we need big data, and if you have to adjust 100 million neurons in a network, and later we're going to download 100 million neural network, and that this has to be fully trained, that means you have to have 100 million connections, you have to find them, you have to learn them. So you learn them by an incredible amount of input data. All these convolutions are today done on these uh, graphics processing units. I'm not going to talk all, all about this too much because most of you know this. These are actually uh, parallel computers. They come from the graphics, uh, uh, from the games. It was impossible to make uh, uh, yeah, very fast processing on these images because there was a, uh, you had to make 60 frames per second, a million pixels, and there was not enough processing power. So a GPU does that uh, much faster. And here is what the GPU now looks like. I just bought a GPU server in my group. Um, it has eight of these GPUs. And every GPU has uh, 3,600 computers on board. So I actually bought almost 30,000 small computers. It cost 30,000 euros, so that's one euro per computer. That's actually very cheap. And this is incredibly fast. So we have now self-driving cars. We all know that. We see uh, that these cars, they see the other cars, they see bikes. This is an example, and that's getting nice. Sorry. If you look at uh, the recent application, these were big images, 1,000 by 2,000 resolution. So that's two megapixels. And these guys in Hong Kong, they succeeded to process this real time. So two million pixels, 30 frames per second. That is what neural networks can do today. And that's quite astonishing. So you can recognize now pedestrians, cars, uh, everything. And this is what the self-driving car is actually seeing. And that's real time. So, and it's still beginning. It, this has been invented a couple of years ago. What happens in five years? Then it is so incredibly much, much more. They do the same in 3D. So it's, it's, it's getting really uh, quite nice. Uh, if I go back to my... I was involved in uh, flower recognition in the Netherlands, and we produce about, I think, one third of all the flowers in the world. It turns out that our dunes and our sea floor is a very nice combination for growing flowers. So we make, uh, I don't know, billions of roses. But there are 400 types of roses, and it was not clear which rose was on the pellet. Uh, which rose did the farmer bring? Was it an expensive one or a cheap one? Uh, and this is a very big hole, it's about six football fields, and every day we have all these millions of flowers coming in. And our computer vision section could recognize which type of rose it was, and that is now currently used for uh, recognition. Okay, we have a learning stage, and now we're going to see what, what is this learning actually doing. If you feed the system and you put the images in there, you do the convolution, the pooling, the convolution, you get at the output here, in this case, your 1,000 classes. So these are 1,000 neurons. And every neuron gives more or less the probability that it is this class. So if, let's say, number 71 is the cap you want, then 71 is, has the highest output, and the other ones are not really zero, but small enough. 
So this is your, uh, your classifier and this is your output. But this is called the forward loop. And you also have the backward loop that's called error propagation. And that means at the end you check, is it all right? No, it's not all right. And then you're going to adjust all the weights until it is all right. Well, you can do this uh, yourself. This is the, the main trick of this deep learning by looking at some very nice tutorials that take you with extremely small numbers of neurons. For example, you have three input neurons, four layers, and three output neurons, and you have just a very limited number of connections. So you start with this. And then all these connections, so this neuron here is connected to all the other ones. So we have this one, to this one, and to this one. They have a name. So this is I1, J1, so that is from the first one. This is I, J, K, L, so they have uh, letters and they have here uh, numbers. All these connections, they fit in the matrix. And what people do, if you really do linear algebra, you can do the, ma the matrix calculations, you can nicely calculate what do these networks if you put some input in there. You start with weights that are random, and you see here all kinds of random numbers between 0 and 1. So that's, that's pretty dumb. The network doesn't know anything. But then, you, for example, you learn digits, and you say, OK, I want to learn a digit. And I put in the figure, a couple of pixels that show 0. And I put in a 0. I have these random weights. And it doesn't give 0, but it gives 0.8. OK, that, that's wrong. You call that wrong the error, and the error is 0.8. So now you're going to adjust all the weights until this is zero. You turn in all these knobs. It's a lot of turning, and people have found very nice optimization tools to do the turning efficiently. So you see some mathematics. It's actually uh, it's an optimization strategy. You want to have uh, the error as small as possible. So you, you adjust, you adjust until the error is smaller and smaller. So you do this with, it's called the gradient descent method. And you have many, many layers. One layer is influencing the previous layer, and then it's previous influencing the layer before that. So you have to do some sensitivity analysis. There's a little bit of uh, complex mathematics, but completely understood. This is very well done. And this is what these programs do, like TensorFlow and uh, all these uh, very nice programs you can download to Torch. They have this on board. So I will show you some demos of this uh, later on. Now I have a demo right here. This is a nice demo that shows the uh, live training of a network. It's called Convolutional Net in JavaScript. JavaScript. So it has a whole bunch of demos, and let's pick out uh, uh, let's pick out a very classical demo. This is the demo that every computer vision scientist takes for his learning. It is simple because you have uh, 60,000 images, very small, 28 by 28 pixels, and they have digits. It's called the MNIST dataset. It's available for free, you can download it, and because it's so small, it fits on every laptop. So, and you also have uh, examples with small images. Let's, let's look at this one. It's now running, and you see that uh, it is actually putting an image in, checking the error, updating the weights. Putting the image in, checking the error, updating the weights. And it does it very fast. That's called the training process. And you see I already did here, this is how much it has done already 2,000 images. And after training a couple of, uh, let's say, 100 images, it is testing with about uh, 10, 10, 20 images. How good is it? Then you see, okay, 10% is still wrong. Okay, 5% is still wrong. 3% is still wrong. So it is testing each time how good is it doing. And here you see the error. Well, the error is quickly going down. And the system is learning. It's getting a pretty good system. It is really a nice uh, detector of uh, digit. Uh, this is the code. You can easily see it. It's only very small numbers of uh, uh, layers. You have a convolution layer, you have a pooling layer, a convolution layer, a pooling layer. You just stack it like Lego. So actually, Programming deep learning is extremely simple. Put your layers in there, train it, and it works. 
And that's why everybody can do it. So there's nothing special about it. So now let's have a look what these filters do. So we look at network visualizations. Well, the first filter was 24 input images, 24 by 24, and we had eight filters in the convolution in the first layer. So here are the first eight filters. And you see that they look like the first derivative in X and in Y, they do some edge detection. So this is what these filt first output filters do. They find contours. So you see the contours of these letters. You can look at uh, what is the, this, this uh, uh, threshold, what does the pooling do, uh, what does the second layer of convolution do. So you can look into, inside these layers, and here you see, while it is still training, that it's doing a pretty good job. Um, all the green areas are, yeah, this seven is, is, is not so good. You see there are a couple of areas that are not so good. But this is a live demo running on my laptop in Java of a neural network. Um, I showed this before. We have done these, these very big banks. And what is uh, Google now doing? It says, well, these GPUs are not big enough anymore. We should make them uh, even much bigger. So we stack even the chips with 3,000 small processors. We stack those on top of each other. So we, we get 3D processors. And they have uh, 65,000 processors <coughs> on one chip. So it gets even, every day it gets more crazy. And these chips are now available. They are now for TPU, so tensor processing unit. And maybe in a couple of years we have uh, even bigger. We have 100,000 of these cores in one chip. There's a company in Eindhoven that uh, is called ASML. They make the machines that make those chips. So these machines are 20 million euros each. And they have 90% of the world production. It's, it, it's a huge company. The turnover last year was 37 billion euros. And they, gave all the, they delivered these machines to Taiwan, to China, to the United States. It's fascinating. And they, they have now incredibly small, I think it's 7 nanometers, that they can make the transistors and small connectors on, on a chip. So that's, that, that goes together. But it's a fascinating way. So we do a lot of uh, processing. And we make the machines bigger and bigger and faster. This machine runs on uh, 3 gigahertz, that's 3 billion processes per second. But I wonder, are we on the right track? Because if I compare these huge data centers that we have now, they use a megawatt, so they have cooling towers on top. But my brain is doing the same if we all do the processing. This guy is only using 25 watts. And this is using 3 gigahertz with 3 million processes per second. And the cells in my, in, in my neurons, they fire at 6 kilohertz. That is not a small difference. That is not 10% difference. That's a difference of 10 to the 15th. So we do something wrong. The brain is so incredibly more clever than we are that I, I think we're on the wrong way by getting more and more complex computers. We should think of how can we make much more clever algorithms. And that's where I'm going to talk about the rest of this, uh, of this talk. So it's not a 20% difference. It is an incredible difference. So we have some lessons from biology. We're going to look a little bit deeper in what have people found today in the brain. The retina is completely different from a retinal, from a normal camera. It's very low resolution. You have actually 23 different retinas looking all at the same time. Um, we have only 1 million fibers going to the, the brain. Well, we have 150 million detectors. So there's a data compression already going on. That's, that's, that's amazing. Um, and I go show you a little bit what today's models are of how the brain might work and how this exactly could lead to far better uh, deep learning systems. And the most leading strategy is how does it save energy? Because we are on the wrong way with losing yeah, megawatt uh, data centers. What we do today is have an infinite variety of all kinds of networks. So a lot of trial and error. And these networks have different layers, different topology, and have branches. They go from narrow to wide. And you have uh, different sizes of filters. Uh, they are rotation invariant. You have uh, uh, 
yeah, so many different uh, types of networks. Um, it's it's fascinating, but it's also confusing uh, because what is missing actually is a unifying theory on how to use it. Um, this is nice. This is a technology from Google. It was released, I think, two years ago. And it's called AutoML. And that does all the automatic adjustment of the network for you. So, they have a beautiful example here. There was a guy in Japan. And in uh, Japan, they have a chain where they make uh, ramen. That's the Japanese noodles. And there were 41 shops where they sold these noodles. All the same product. So it's a bowl with noodles and some meat on top. But every cook in these 41 shops had a little bit of different styles on cooking. Slicing the meat a little bit thicker. So they collected hundreds of pictures from one shop, from the noodles, from another shop. And then they, put the, they trained the network and they wanted to find out which plate of noodles was coming from which shop. And they were all very alike, but this network was able, 94% accuracy, and here you see the confusion matrix. All the right values are on the uh, on, on, on the diagonal. So from learning a few hundred of these plates, and what network did you use? Well, Google found it out. Google tested 20,000 times different network, 20,000 different networks. So with 17 layers, with 18 layers, with 19 layers, with all the different. And it does it all for you. And Google is so fast that it found the optimal network, and this means you can use this. You put your data in there, and if it is noodle recognition, or tumor recognition, or whatever, car recognition, or letter recognition, you let AutoML find a network, and it does it for you. So the world today is really easy. So I'm waiting for you to do actually this, and then you will, you will be incredibly successful with money until someone else improves you, and he earns the money. You have to be fast, but the tools are there right now. Um, this is a very nice, uh, maybe you all know it already, it's called medium.com. And if you look at uh, medium, it is a blog for, let's say, a little bit more scientific uh, things, and it goes about everything. Culture, tech, startups. But if you look at uh, technology, you see there is a whole series here on artificial intelligence. And every day you have an incredible amount of uh, uh, new papers. But here you see machine learning. And that's nice for you to follow because all these little blogs are more or less tutorials. And they really give you a nice introduction to what is principal component analysis. How different is normalization from standardization? What is k-means clustering? And all these things that you see in these <coughs> let's say terminology, are nicely explained by these guys, and I really love it. It's very scientific American style reading, and if you want to start, it has so many examples. Um, this, for example, I saw yesterday. First steps, deep learning using Python and Chaos. Everybody's today using Python and Chaos. Keras is a kind of a super level on top of Python, and in Keras you can just write simple lines, convolution, pooling, convolution, pooling, so. And uh, let's look at what this guy is telling you. Uh, he says, well, I have a nice uh, toolbox for you. And this is easy reading. Uh, if you want to go a little bit deeper, you, and he says, well, you, you need Python, you need Anaconda, you need TensorFlow, you need uh, Jupyter Notebooks, you need Keras. And he explains step by step, what is Python? Where can you download it? What is Anaconda? What is a Jupyter Notebook? 